Hey there nation, welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Chiefs Gamer, back on the episode of Shadows Over Mordheim, our weekly battle report series from Mordheim. And this is battle report number 9, and it is a street brawl scenario, which is a multiplayer scenario. And this time we got four different warbands throwing it down on this one. So my four friends, Lady Domina, Sister Serial, Brother Grim, as well as Scream of the Emo will be fighting against each other in a four-way fight in the street boss scenario. Lady Domina is bringing the untamed beasts of the Norse Marauders. Sister Sarah will be playing the Iron Golems of the Pit Fighters. Brother Grim will be playing the People Eaters of the Mob Rules. And then finally, Scream of the Emo will be playing House Von Koss of the Undead. So it is a four-way fight to the death in a Battle Royale-style combat, fighting it out in the mean streets of Mordheim. So we're going to play some background music real quick. If you want to see exactly what we're bringing for this one, go ahead and pause and take a look at your own leisure. So with that being said, let's get this battle port on a roll. Ram, I have never prayed to you before. I have no tongue for it. No one, not even you will remember if we were good men or bad. Why we fought or why we died. No. All that matters is that two stood against many. That's what's important. Barbara pleases you, Kram. So grant me one request. Grant me revenge. And if you do not listen, then the hell with you. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying times here. All right, so the scenario rules for this one is Street Brawl. Basically, each of the players use their normal warband setup. All four sides of the table on a 4x4 table is occupied by each of a different warband. Pretty much, the uh, players take a turn rolling a d6 as he goes first, and whoever has the highest results, then we go around the table in a clockwise pattern to see who is actually going next. Uh, pretty much, the game ends when all the warbands save one have failed their route test, and the routers automatically lose, and the last remaining warband automatically wins. For the experience on this one, for each fighter who manages to survive the scenario, both heroes and hitchmen, they get plus one experience point. Also, if the winning gang, the uh, warband leader who manages to survive to the end of the battle report also earns an experience point as well. And then plus heroes also earn one point of experience for each enemy fire they also take out of action. And that pretty much makes up the scenario rules for the street brawl. So with the scenario rules over, let's go and talk about the uh, battle plan real quick. All right, so let's go talk about the battle plan real fast. So as you can see, my friends are playing on a 4x4 table. Brother Grimm's uh, the people of those orcs and goblins warband is deployed on the near side of the table. Uh, Lady Domina's untamed beast Norse Marauders warband is located on the left hand side of the table. On the very top of the table we have Sister Serial with her Iron Golems Pit Fighters warband. And on the far right hand side of the table we have House Von Koss, the undead warband, which is played by my friend Scream the Emo. And the top left hand corner there we have an Itsy Bitsy Spider using the Random Encounters table from the uh, annual 2002 annual for Mordheim. So that way we can have a random encounter. We have a giant spider that's lurking through the forest outside of the Mordheim. Mordheim Gatehouse that's going to be slipping to the ruins and the warbands will have to deal with that later. Um, as for what the battle plan is, I'm not really sure what the battle plan is on this one because I'm not playing in this scenario. All I'm doing is taking photos for the campaign. Uh, you'll ask my friends exactly what they got planned out. So with that being said, let's go and talk about deployment real quick. Up first we have the People Eaters of the Mob Rules, the Orcs and Goblins Warband. On the left hand side there it looks like we have the War Boy, he's an Orc Boy, he's equipped with a bow, he's also got the Animosity Special Rule. Right in front of him are two members of the Sneaky Gits, which are two Goblins equipped with spears, daggers, they have the Animosity, as well as Not Orcs, as well as Runt Special Rules. And leading them to the front, that is the Shroomhead, he is a Goblin Warrior who's equipped with Mad Cat Mushrooms, as well as a Ball and Chain. Over here in the left hand side, right in the center, right in the middle of the battlefield, we actually have a little small little six man war party. Uh, in that unit, we have two guys, Ugla de Belade, as well as Zappa de Snappa. They're both biggins who are equipped with swords, bows, as well as shields. And I forgot to mention that Zappa the Snappa's got the Well Arch special rule. Also located in that area is also Papa Shango, who's an orc boss. He's equipped with light armor, shield, dagger, sword, bow. He's also got the leader skill. And in that unit as well are three members of the Ludas, which are three goblins equipped with spears, bows, and shields. And they also have the animosity, not orcs and runs special rules. And then on the far right hand side, we have the Manglas, which are three cave squigs with gobs of teeth. They got movement, hinders, not orcs, and animal special rules. Leading that unit is Stavis Dabba, who is a goblin warrior who's armed with a squig prodder. And then right behind them is Baron Zamidi, the orc shaman, who's got a knife, bow, as well as a wizard. He's also packing the uh, clubba spell, which gives him plus two strength and one attack for, until he runs out of uh, wounds. And uh, that pretty much makes up the deployment for the people eaters. Meanwhile, on the left-hand side, we have the deployment for the Undamed Beast, the Norse war, uh, Marauders Warband. Over here on the left-hand side, right behind that ruined building, 
Up in the top there, we have a uh, uh, little three-man fire team. Up at the top is Veril Hearteater. He is the Jarl for this group, who's the Warband Leader. He's equipped with a helmet, shield, axe. He's got the Seaman as well as Leader Skill. And with him as well are two Bondsmith, that is Shunked, as well as Cliff Skull. They're both Bondsmen. They're both equipped with shields, great weapons, as well as a Seaman Skill. And then farther in the bottom left hand, right-hand corner there, the battlefield behind that room building. Up in the front and the center, that's Ugla the Maw. He is a Wolfen. He's got horrible scars, fear, as well as Beast Shield Skill. On the left hand side is Mayan Beast Speaker. She's a Berserker who's equipped with Shield Flail. She's also got the Seaman as well as Berserker Skill. And right next to the bottom on the right hand side, that is Tenyet First Fang. He's also a Berserker who's got a Shield Great Weapon. He's got the Seaman as well as Berserker Skill as well. And that pretty much makes up the plummy here on the left hand side for the Untamed Beasts. And finally for the Untamed Beasts, we have three Hunters uh, up on the top there. That is Shuya. She has the, uh, she's the one with the uh, pink top knot. Followed by Makat, who's the guy in the bottom there with the green top knot. And then finally we have Shroy, who's got the uh, orange top knot as well. All three of those Hunters are equipped with shields, twin axes, as well as bows. And that pretty much makes the deployment here for the Untamed Beasts. Meanwhile, on the far left hand side, right hand side of the battlefield is the plant for House Von Koss, right between the uh, orange roof building as well as the tower. Uh, we have three uh, members of the Bellflower Carnival. There are three ghouls named Bloodwind, Scumrick, as well as Killham. Those are three ghouls. And right in front of them is the Hound of Tindalos, which is a dire wolf. And that makes up the deployment on the left hand side for the uh, House Von Koss. In the center of Screamo Emo's deployment area, we have the Dead of San Romeo, which is a unit of five zombies, and then leading them as well is Gauntfield of Carrion Crows, who is a necromancer who's carrying a knife, a short bow. He's also got the reanimation spell as well. And that pretty much makes up Screamo Emo's center deployment on this one. And finally, at the top of the Wooden War Tower is uh, Scream of the Emo's rest of his warband. On the far right-hand side, that is Fade Von Koss. He's a vampire. He's also the warband leader. He's packing a knife, sword, shortbow, and st uh, shield. He's got the leader, feel, immune to psychology, and poison, and no pain special abilities as well. And leading that unit is another three members who are dregs. On the right-hand side, that is uh, right-hand side there, that is uh, Creepy Timothy. He's a dreg. He's equipped with a knife, shortbow, as well as a halberd. In the middle is Narcisse the Dravenous, who's also another dreg. He's got a knife, a shortbow, as well as a halberd on the left hand side that is sinister jeffrey who's a drag who's equipped with knife a short bow as well as an axe and that pretty much makes up the entirety of house von Koss for this one and all the way across the other side of the table on the very top is sister serials iron golems the pit fighter warband over here on the left hand side as you can see in the center of her deployment area that is uh Drej borsha he is an orgor pit fighter he's got twin hammers as well as light armor he's got the pit fighter fear large as well as slow rated skills Right next to him on the far right hand side are two other members of the warband. First of all, we got uh, Garn Dramnir in the back there, right behind the little ruins there. That's a pit fighter veteran who's equipped with a war chain, mace, as well as a pit fighter skill. Next to her is Voss Hadun, who's another pit fighter veteran who's equipped with shield, hammer, light armor, as well as a pit fighter skill. And then leading them is Sever Griel on the far right hand side. He's a pit king, is equipped with a great weapon, light armor. He's got the leader skill, as well as a pit fighter skill. And he's also got the resilient skill as well. And that pretty much makes the plummy here on the far right hand side. And then finally for Sister Serial on the top of the crumbling aqueduct that cuts through the relative center of the battlefield, we have three pursuers. All three of them are armed exactly the same with mace, shield, javelins. All three have the pit fighter skill. And those are Krola Ilvec, Dan, Dran Ilvec, as well as Varsk Ilvec. And that pretty much makes up Sister Serial's deployment on this one. And finally, the top left-hand corner of the battlefield is the Hateful Eight, which is an itsy bitsy spider, which is basically a giant spider that showed up on the random uh, encounters table. It's basically got uh, five wounds, I think it's toughness four, strength four, and also it charges the nearest warband that's closest to it as it makes its way across the entirety of the battlefield. So it looks kind of ominous as it comes slipping through the forest just outside the gated walls of Mordheim. So with the deployment over with, we go directly to the top of turn number one when my friends Scream of the Emo, Scissor Serial, Lady Domina, as well as Brother Grim roll off for initiative to see who will be going first. All right, so that takes directly to the top of turn number one, and Brother Grim Magic gets the initiative on this one, so the orcs and goblins will be going first. And because of the uh, rules, we'll be going in a clockwise, uh, clockwise uh, direction around the table to see who'll be going next. So after Brother Grim will be Lady Domino with her Norse Warband, followed by Sister Serial with her Pit Fighter Warband, and lastly with uh, Scream of the Emo with his Undead Warband. So as you can see here, this is the word hit shot in the entirety of the battlefield. This is taken after the move phase. As you can see for Brother Grim, he just basically shifts his entire Warband over to the left-hand side, getting ready to intercept the Norse Marauders. He sees them as the most clear threat for him, so he starts moving everything over to the left-hand side for the most part. 
All right, so here we go right directly to the move phase. As you can see, everything in his warband just kind of shifts left as well as to the front. Uh, pretty much the uh, two biggins as well as the leader and the lutas, they move up forward in order to engage the marauders up in the front, while the uh, cave squigs as well as Stavastaba as well as Baron's Zemini move to the left-hand side in order to intercept as well. Uh, just right off the bat, the Shroomid does manage to charge right through the building on the left-hand side and goes directly into, I think it's Ugla the Maw, which is the uh, wolfen that belongs to the Nor uh, Norse marauders. At the same time, uh, the two sneaky kits as well as the war but they also slip into the building as well. And finally, here's a close-up of the inside of the building. As you can see, you can kind of make up the war boy as well as the two sneaky gits who are sneaking inside the house. And you can see that the shroom had actually charged. I'm sorry, I do apologize. He didn't charge directly into Ugla the Maw. He charged into Mayim Beast Speaker, which is one of the berserkers there on the left-hand side. And that guy's got the mad cat mushrooms as well as ball and chain, so because that, he'll be acting like a fanatic. So with the move phase over with, we go directly to the shooting phase. So during the shooting phase, Papa Shango as well as Ugla the Blade and Zappa the Snappa, they open up with their bows. Same thing with the Ludas. They open it directly onto the three Marauders right across from them. For the most part, most of their shots lost. However, one shot did manage, two shots, I'm sorry, managed to hit as well as wound uh, one of the Hunters as well. Also managed to slip through his armor and also put him in an adverse action result as well. So because of that, that Hunter does go out of action and he will need to roll up on the serious injury table to see exactly what happens to him. And that uh, Hunter's name is Macat is his name. He's the guy with the green top knot and he goes directly out of action. So with that, we go directly to the combat phase, and since the Shroomhead has taken the Mad Cat Mushroom, he's got Frenzy any charge, he goes directly into Mayan Beast Speaker with that huge ball and chain. Managed to hit that character twice, as well as get a critical wound off from the second hit as well. Managed to put Mayan Beast Speaker directly out of action. So just like that, the very first member of the Untamed Beasts go out of action, and the uh, people leaders also get themselves a uh, first blood result as well. To make matters worse, my brother, my friend Brother Grim decides to roll off on the random directions table to see exactly what ends up happening to the Shroomhead because after his initial attack, it's pretty much just random on a table to exactly see what he does. Uh, managed to control him, so because that, he guards him, sends him directly, directly into Ugla the Maw, so because of that, Ugla the Maw is now in close combat with the uh, little fanatic, the Shroomhead, for that point. And that pretty much makes up turn number one for the Orcs and Goblins. All right, so with that, we go directly to the top of turn number one from the Norse Marauders, so Lady Dominic gets to go next. The first thing that she decides to do is charge forward Veral Heart Eater directly into the building, engaging uh, the Warboy in close combat. At the same time, she also charges in her two Bondsmen Shanked as well as Skull. Uh, I believe they go directly into Ugla the Blade is who they end up going into as well in order to engage him in close combat, so that way they can start, you know, causing some wounds and stuff and start messing up the different orcs and goblins as time goes on as well. At the same time that's occurring, at the same time that's occurring, the Berserker uh, Tinyat First Fang, he also charged directly into the Shroomhead so that way he can support Ugla the Maw as they're both fighting against the Fanatic. So here's a close up of the move phase. You can see both Shuya as well as Makat are still hiding out right there on the top of the ruins with their long or their bows. Get ready to take some pot shots directly at the Orcs and Goblins. And here's a close up of uh, Shanked as well as Clefchild going directly into Ugla the Snap. Uh, Ugla the. Not Ugla the Blade. I believe that's Zappa the Snap. That's who it goes into. So Zappa the Snap ends up going into close combat as well. And uh, that pretty much makes it the close up on that one. And here's a close up inside the building as Veral Heart Eater, the Jarl of this warband, goes directly into the Warboy, engaging that orc into close combat. And finally, here's a close up of Tenyet First Fang going directly into the Shroomhead, uh, helping out Ugla the Maw fight against that fanatic. So with the move phase over with, we go directly to the shooting phase. And during the shooting phase, both hunters, Makat as well as Shuya, they opened up with their bows directly into the Ludas, but for the most part though, they only managed to put a knockout result on one of the Ludas, so he goes crashing face down the ground and bleeding out. The other shots just pretty much don't do anything much for the most part. So with the shooting phase over with, you go directly to the combat phase. And in the combat phase, it basically goes with Ugla the Maw. Ugla the Maw gets to go first in his close combat. Unfortunately for him, though, his attacks just flood for the most part. It's because I wasn't able to get anything to the Shroomhead. And since the Shroomhead gets to go next, he directed all of his attacks directly at Ugla the Maw. Managed to put that guy out of action as well. So just like that, another member of the Untamed Beast has to roll up on the series injury table. And Lady Dama just lost another one of her fighters as well. Now, in order to do that, of course, the Shroomhead had to direct both of his attacks directly into Ugla the Maw, leaving him open for a counterattack from Tenyet First Fang. And as you can guess, Tinyet First Fang had no problem just putting the hurting on directly onto the Shrinking Shroomhead. Actually managed to put him out of action as well, uh, just because he's got the Berserker skill. He has Frenzy, and he also has a great weapon, so wasn't that much of a reaction to see that actually happen. So not only does he finish that guy off, he also just kind of kills him as well. 
Meanwhile, in the uh, combat phase, you have Veril Heart Eater managed to put a knocked out result directly onto the Warboy. So because of the Warboy goes crashing face down on the ground and he is currently bleeding out, which is a bad spot for that orc to be in because in the next turn, Veril Heart Eater could just finish him off real quick in close combat and he'll be Veril Evil and goes automatically out of action, which would be a bad thing for my buddy Brother Grim. And finally, you can see that the uh, two uh, bots had no problem taking out Zappa the Snappa. So because of that, they both of them go in different directions. Um, as you can see here, Clef Skull goes to the left-hand side directly towards Stabba Stabba. And then finally, you got Shane to goes to the right-hand side engaging in close combat with the fallen member of the Ludus as well. And uh, that pretty much makes it the combat phase on this one. So with combat phase over with, you go directly to the top of turn number one for the Pit Fighters. All right, so we're still in turn number one, so we go directly across the battlefield to the pit fighters. And you can see here, this photo is taken after the moon phase. For the most part, Sister Cheryl just runs up her fighters as quick as she can around the ruins, heading down directly towards the center of the battlefield, while her hunters also run along the top of the aqueducts as well, closing the distance directly to the undead warband. So as you can see, here's a close-up of the majority of her warband is running up forward. On the left-hand side is Dredge Borsha. At the same time, you can see Garn Dramner as well as Vos Hadun moving up quickly with Sever Grill. And on the right-hand side, you can see the Banner of Eld, which is the uh, troll fighter who works for this group as well. The troll slayer who also works for this group as well, just kind of tucked right behind there along the aqueduct. And finally, here's a close-up of the Hunter's Ilvec. That is Krola, Dran, as well as Varsk, as we're along the top of the Aqueducts heading directly towards the Undead Warband. And since both, everybody in this Warband ran, there is no shooting phase, there is no close combat, so we go directly to the top of turn number one for the Undead Warbands. All right, so that takes directly the top of turn number one for the Undead Warbands, and this photo is taken after the moon phase because we skipped the... Uh, the recovery phase because nothing has really happened for the most part and as you can see in this photo most of the undead warband moves up as quickly as they possibly can in order to start engaging fighters in the middle of the battlefield first of all on the left hand on the very bottom there uh the hound of tendlos moves up nine inches right beneath the little aqueduct there make it look like he's going towards the right hand flank of the orcs following him of course march running up in full eight inches are the three members of the belfire carnival bloodwind scumrick as well as killham follow closely up behind him as well at the same time, the five zombies of the rock and of the dead of San Ramey just kind of shamble up forward towards the uh, palisade there at the base of the tower, with uh, Gauntfield and Carrion Crew slowly uh, behind them and also following as well. And of course, the rest of the uh, warband, the three dregs, as well as the vampire, Bade von Koss, uh, they just stay directly on the top of the tower, uh, just taking cover positions for the most part. So here's a close of Fade Von Koss, as well as Narcisse the Ravenous, Creepy Timothy, as well as Sinister Jeffrey, just taking cover positions there on the top of the war tower. And here's a close-up of the Walking Dead of San Rame, as well as Gauntfeld Carrion Crows right behind them, moving towards the Palisade, directly into the main center of the fray. And finally, here's a close-up of the three members of the Bellfire Carnival, Bloodwind, Scumrick, as well as Killham, as well as the Hound of Tendalos, making their way to the bottom portion of the screen. So with the move phase over with, you go directly to the shooting phase. And during the shooting phase, disaster strikes for the pit fighters of the Iron Golems. Fade Von Koss, as well as Narcisse the Ravenous, Creepy Timothy, as well as Sinister Jeffrey, all open up with their short bows directly into the three hunters. Now, for the most part, not much has really happened for them. Uh, basically, those guys were hit. I believe they put a stun result on two of the fighters, is what it ended up happening. That was being Krola Ilvec, as well as Dran. Now, because they both have been stunned, they had to take initiative tests, which, unfortunately for them, they actually failed those initiative tests, and they fall to the ground, suffering strength seven hits. I believe I believe uh, Krola Ilvec suffered two of them, while Dran Ilvec only suffered one. In the end, however, it ended up being a really positive note for the most part. Krola Ilvec actually ended up with a stun result, so he's laying faced up because he just nearly had the wear knocked out of him. And Dran Ilvec actually got a knocked down result, so he does face down bleeding on the ground for right now. But if all else fails during the recovery phase, he can turn around and be stunned again, and then after that, get back on his feet again, and he can still participate in the battle report. So, by all accounts, his Sarah got really lucky on that one. So with the moving phase over, uh, shooting phase over with for the undead, uh, that takes us directly to the last of the turn, where we go for the Hateful Eight, the Giant Spider. All right, so that takes us directly to the top of turn number one for the Hateful Eight, the Giant Spider, which I am controlling on this one, so it's actually kind of cool. Uh, as the rules state, the random encounter will have to move through the towards the closest warband closest to it. So because that moves up 10 inches up the wall of the gatehouse for the uh, outside wall of Mordheim, and it just kind of sits on the roof of the gatehouse, lurking and observing the battlefield, figuring out which warband it's going to engage into next. And here's a close-up of the Hateful Eight, just kind of chilling out at the top of the gatehouse, looking all sinister as he crawls over the roof of the building, looking for his first victim and looking for fresh prey in order to feast upon. So with that being said, that pretty much ends turn number two, and we go directly to the top of turn number two for the Orcs and Goblins. 
So for the orcs and goblins, we go directly to the top of turn number two, and this is actually after the recovery phase. As you can see in the top there, the warboy actually makes a, he kind of flips around because right now he's stunned. He's no longer knocked out. Same thing with one of the members of the Ludus as well. He turns face up as well. And uh, that pretty much makes the recovery phase for the orcs and goblins. So with that, that takes us directly to the movement phase, and as you can see in this footer, which again, uh, pretty much the orcs just kind of consolidate and start charging to their opponents as well. Um, Ugla the Blade, as well as Baron Zamidi, as well as the Warlord uh, Papa Shango, they go charging directly into the Bondsman, and then trying to surround those guys. Same thing with the Ludus as well, in order to catch those guys in the full development. At the same time, the Manglas of the Three Cave Squigs, as well as Stabba Stabba, the uh, Goblin with the Prodder, uh, they go charging through the house and go directly in across the battlefield into Tenyet Beast Speaker, uh, uh, first Fang, I believe is his name. Uh, that's the actual uh, Berserker who's on the other side of the house as well. Charging right through the house in order to engage him in close combat. That's pretty much what they do with as well. And uh, that pretty much makes the move phase for the Orcs and Goblins. So here's a close-up of the Orcs and Goblins swarming the two Bondsmiths. So they started surrounding Cleftjaw as well as Shank. They're completely surrounded by Goblins as well as Orcs. And that's a really bad spot to be in. I forgot to mention this, but the two Sneaky Gits also charge directly into Veral Heart Eater, so that way they make sure that he doesn't manage to finish off their friend the War Boy in close combat as well. I forgot to mention that too. And finally, there's a close-up of Stabba Stabba, as well as the three members of the Manglas, the Cave Squid, charging directly into Tenya First Fang and engaging that Berserker into close combat as well. So with the move phase over with, you go directly to the shooting phase. So during the shooting phase, no one can really shoot because they're engaged in close combat. However, Baron Zemini does cast Clubba, the Clubba spell onto him, giving him plus two strength as well as plus one to his attacks as well, making him extremely lethal for a wizard directly into close combat. So with the shooting phase over with, we go directly to the combat phase. And as you can see in the combat phase, all kinds of bad things end up happening for the Norse Marauders of the Untamed Beast. First of all, uh, Shanked as well as Clef, both those guys, Clef Skull, they both go down, crashing down with out of action results, uh, being taken out of action by Ugla the Blade, as well, I believe it was Baron Zamidi who actually managed to take out the, uh, I think, I'm oh, sorry, I think it was Baron Zamidi who was able to, able to take out uh, Clef Skull there on the bottom of the screen. At the same time, uh, Shanked, he got taken out by, of course, uh, Papa Shango, the warlord, who's the, uh, the orc boss, who's also the leader of this war band as well. So things are looking very bad for the Untamed Beast at this point. At the same time, Veral Heart Eater is able to put a critical injury directly onto one of the Sneaky Gits. Managed to put that guy out of action, which is kind of good. But he's still currently engaged in close combat with the second one of those goblins. So that part is not so great. And at the same time, the combined attacks from the Manglas as well as Stabba Stabba was enough to finish off Tinya at first fang. So because of that, that Berserker also goes out of action and he will also need to roll up on the series in your table to see exactly what happens to him. So with the uh, combat phase over with, we go directly to the top of turn number two for the Untamed Beasts Warband. So with that, we go directly to the recovery phase for the Norse Marauders for the Untamed Beast. And unfortunately for my friend Lady Dominus, she went to test to see if she stands her ground. She rolled box cards, and her leadership value is only 8. So just like that, the Untamed Beasts are the very first warband to be routed in this scenario. So because of that, Lady Dominus will no longer be participating for the rest of the scenario. So with the Untamed, war be uh, untamed Beast done, we go directly to the top of the uh, table, and we go directly to the Iron Golems for Sister Serial. All right, so with that, we go directly to the top of turn number two for the pit fires in this one. This is directly into recovery phase. And as you can see in this photo, Krola, Krola Elvec managed to get back on his feet again since he only not suffered a stun result. So because he's back on his feet, ready to do some fighting. At the same time, Drowned Elvec flips over because he is now from knocked out to stunned as well. So these guys are both making a speed recovery as time goes on. So with the recovery phase over with, you go directly to the movement phase. And here's an overhead shot of the entirety of the battlefield at the end of the move phase for Scissor Serial. And for the most part, she basically sent her pit fighters heading to the right hand side as they slowly make their way directly to the undead warband. Looks like my friend Lady Don my friend Scissor Serial wants to escape the wrath of the Hateful Eight, or there's the giant spider there at the top of the gatehouse. By moving over the right hand side, she's ensured that her warband is completely safe and away from harm from the Hateful Eight, which means that the closest warband to them at that point will be directly across the battlefield where the Orcs and Goblins are located at. While that's occurring, of course, she also has Varsky. Ilvek dropped down from the top of the, uh, of the aqueducts directly into the ruins right in front of O'Reilly Hall there in the upper right-hand corner, and the rest of her fighters kind of run as well to the right-hand side, making their way directly towards the undead warband for the most part. So here's a close-up for the majority of her warband slipping through the aqueduct, heading to the right-hand side. As you can see, Sever Grill, Garn Drammer, Voss Hadun, Banner the Eld, Dredge, Borsha, as well as Krola Elvek move as quick as they can across the other side of the battlefield. And the top of the screen there, you can see Varsk Elvek dropping down from the top of the aqueduct directly into the roof of the uh, ruins there. And that pretty much makes up Sister Serial's entire turn. Because everybody ran, nobody shoots, and there is no close combat, so we directly to the top of turn number two for the vampire counts.
All right, so that takes directly to the top of number two for the undead, and this photo is taken after the move phase. They skip recovery because nobody's hurt, and for the most part, as you can see here, my friend Scream of the Emo decides to react and send most of his forces charging directly into the pit fighters. The pit fighters are in perfect resistance for the zombies from the dead of the town made to charge directly into them, so that's exactly what they do. At the same time, she also moves up the hand of Tindalos and runs up her three members of the Belfire Carnival, Bloodwind, Scumrick, as well as Killhammer, to enjoy the fray as well. Meanwhile, the Narcisse, Creepy Timothy, and Sinister Jeffrey get into better cover positions on the top of the tower so that way they can rain down some long distance shots with their short bows and Fade Vodkos actually does a uh, spends his turn running down from the top of the tower directly to the base so that way he can start engaging the members of the pit fighters as well. So here's a close-up of the Hound of Tindalos as well as Bloodwind, Scamrick, as well as Killham moving as quick as he possibly can to join the zombies of the Dead of the Dead of San Rame. And you can see that, that Gonfield of Carrion Crows also moved forward as well so that way he can land some long range shots with his short bows. And here's a close up of the zombies from the dead of Samra May charging directly into Dresh Borsha as well as Sever Greel. Three of the zombies go to Dresh Borsha, the ogre pit fighter, while the other two goes directly into Sever Greel and engage him in close combat as well. And that pretty much makes it the move phase for this part. Meanwhile, has a close-up at the top of the tower as Creepy Timothy, followed by Narcisse the Ravenous, as well as Sinister Jeffrey, take a cover positions on the top of the tower so that they can lay down some long-range fire with their short bows from the top of the tower as well as from that gangplank. And finally, here's a close-up of Fade Von Koss, who's actually dropped down from the top of the tower directly on the ground level, so that way he can charge into the fray and start engaging some pit fighters as well. So with the moon phase over with, we skip the shooting phase, because unfortunately for my friend Scream of the Emo, his three dregs all miss their shots, and we go directly to the combat phase. And in the combat phase, ended up being an absolute slaughter for the uh, undead for the most part. As you can see here, Dredge Borsha manages to put two of those zombies directly out of action and leaving the third one completely unscathed. He does lose a wound for his troubles, but that's about the worst of it. Meanwhile, Silver Grill managed to put one and knock, managed to knock out one of the zombies as well as stun the other one. So because of that, only one zombie remains unscathed at the San Re Walking Dead of San Rame, which is all kinds of horrible for my buddy Scream of the Emo. So with the combat phase over with, you go directly to the top of the turn for the Hateful Eight. So the rest of turn number two is dedicated for the Hateful Eight, which is the giant spider that has randomly encountered the on top of the table. As you can see in this photo, the Hateful Eight starts making his way slowly across the table from the top of the gatehouse, directly into the interior of Mordheim, as it starts skiddling its way directly towards the orcs and goblins on the bottom of the screen there. And here's a pretty cool close-up of uh, the Hateful Eight as he slithers down the top of the wall and making his way across the battlefield past the carts and barrels and the ruins, making his way directly towards the orcs and goblins. And that pretty much finishes up turn number two. So with turn number two over with, you go directly to the top of turn number three for the orcs and goblins. All right, so that takes directly to the top of turn number three for the orcs and goblins. And as you can see in the recovery phase, the warp Foy does finally make a full recovery, gets back on his feet again. Same thing with one of the members of the Ludas as well. So with the recovery phase over with, you go directly to the move phase. And in the move phase, the entirety of the people eaters start moving up as, as kind of digitally directly towards the Hateful Eight as well. They kind of take a covered position behind the ruins there on the left hand side, so that way some of them still have line of sight so they can shoot at the uh, giant spider with bows and arrows. At the same time, the rest of the warband just kind of sneaks up there on the left hand side, takes covered positions. It looks like they're kind of go for an envelopment technique, trying to catch that giant spider and a pincer attack for the most part. So here's a close-up of the move phase. As you can see, the uh, eight, uh, as you can see, the Ludas, as well as the two Biggins, I'm uh, sorry, one of the Biggins, Ugla the Blade, as well as Papa Shango, Baron Zamidi, the War Boy, as well as one of the Sneaky Gits, they move up to the right-hand side to the uh, ruins, so that way they have a good line of sight to open fire with some bows and arrows directly at the Hateful Eight. At the same time, you can see that Stabba Stabba, as well as the three members of the Manglas, they move the way to the left-hand side of the uh, ruins, where it looks like they're trying to flank the Hateful Eight as well. So with the move phase over with, we go directly to the shooting phase. And during the shooting phase, the orcs and goblins manage to clink off three wounds directly onto the Hateful Eight. So because of that, this thing is three quarters dead because the Hateful Eight only has one more wound before it is finished off, which is all kinds of awesome for the orcs and goblins. So with the shooting phase over with, we skip combat phase because no one's engaged in close combat, and we go directly to the top of turn number three for the pit fighters. So in turn number three for the pit fighters, we go directly to the recovery phase. As you can see here, Drown Elvec managed to get back on his feet again. He's no longer stunned, and he's ready to participate for the rest of the battle report. So with the recovery phase over with, we go directly to the move phase. And in the move phase, the pretty much what ends up happening is the rest of the pit fighters pretty much move in to engage the rest of the undead warband for the most part. Uh, to, for right now, Server Grill as well as Dredge Borsha, the ogre pit fighter, as well as the pit king, they're currently engaged in close combat zombies, so nothing much really happens there. Uh, while that's occurring, I believe Garden Dramnir as well as Banner the L charge directly into Fade Von Kost the vampire, engaging him in close combat. While it's occurring, Vasa Dune as well as Krola Ilvek, Dran Ilvek, as well as Varsk Ilvek, they move along the 
the parallel down the uh, uh, the, aqua, uh, the aqueduct there, so that way they can start getting in the range of fire javelins directly at the uh, what you call it, directly at the um, at the undead that is located on the bottom of the screen for the most part. And uh, that pretty much makes the move phase on this one. All right, so here's a close-up of Vas Hadun as he charges directly into the Hound of Tindalos, engaging that guy in close combat. And you can see that that's Varskill Vec as he makes his way closer towards Godfrey the Carrion Crow, so that way he can start throwing javelins at that guy. Meanwhile, here's a close-up of Sarah Greel as well as Dredge Borsha, which are currently engaged with some undead zombies. At the same time, you can see that uh, Varskill Vec is making his way right behind Sarah Greel in order to lend him support. In the back there, you can see uh, Dron Ilvec as he makes his way along the aqueducts, getting closer to throw javelins directly at the undead as well. And finally, here's a close-up of Vasadun as well as for Banner the Eld, the pet fighter veteran, as well as the dwarf troll slayer, as they charge directly into Fade Von Koss and engage him in close combat as well. So with the move phase over with, we go directly to the shooting phase. And in the shooting phase, Krola and Dran Ilvek, both of them throw their javelins directly into Gauntfield of Carrion Crows, and both of them wound him as well. I believe Krola Ilvek managed to get like a normal knocked out result, I think we ended up having for his attack. However, it was Dran Ilvek who threw the critical hit that rolled a perfect six to wound, as well as a perfect six for the critical hit, gaining double damage, as well as plus two for the injury roll dice. So because of that, uh, Gauntfield of Carrion Crows goes crashing face down to the ground, being skewered by two javelins, and when he rolled up from the injury, he screamed the emo rolled a four on that one, which automatically bumps it to a six. It's because of that, Godfall of Karen Crow does go out of action, and he will need to roll in the serious injury table to see exactly what happens to him. So, with the shooting phase over, we go directly to the combat phase. And in the combat phase, more destruction befalls the undead as the pit fighters live up to their reputation. So first of all, uh, Dredge Borshin managed to finish off the two zombie, uh, this one zombie is engaged in close combat with, managing it twice as well as wounding him twice, also putting him directly out of action. So because of that, the zombie is now dead. Meanwhile, at the same time, Silver Grill directs one of his attack directly into one zo onto the zombie that was engaged in close combat, managed to hit and wound him, also put him out of action, rolling a five for the injury result. And since he had one, left, one attack left over, he decided to finish off the zombie that he had knocked out earlier and managed to kill the very last zombie of the walking dead of San Rame. So just like that, the entire five-man unit is wiped out. And to make matters worse, close combat over here, Garn Dramnir as well as Banner the Eld engage in close combat with Fade uh, Von Koss. If I remember correctly, I believe uh, Banner the Eld managed to take a wound off of Fade, and it was Garn Dramnir that managed to finish him off in close combat, managed to put an out of action result directly onto him, and also netting herself an additional point of experience as well. So because that Garn Dramnir, the female pit fighter veteran, is doing very, very well for herself as she earns two experience points for taking out fighters this game. So with that being said, that pretty much ends up the pit fighters for turn number three. So with that, we go directly to the top of turn number three for the undead warband. So with that, we go directly to the top of turn number three for the undead and go directly into the recovery phase. And the first thing they have to do, of course, is take a route test. Since the only guy left with the highest leadership is uh, one of the dregs, they roll to see exactly if they stay. On my friend's screen, the email rolls a 10. So because of that, uh, pretty much just breaks the undead warband's leadership values on that one. I believe the dregs value, uh, leadership value, I think, is a 6. I think, no, it's a 7 is the highest it has. So it just kind of just destroys that. So because of that, just like that, the undead are routing off the battlefield and only two more warbands are left on the battlefield. So with that, the deck's directly at the top of turn number three for the Hateful Eight, and just like that, my giant spider charges directly into the people leaders on the left-hand side, engaging two members of the Ludas in the close combat as well. So here's a close-up of the Hateful Eight as it skitters across the battlefield directly into the two Ludas of the goblins of the uh, goblin henchmen for the people leaders, engages those guys in close combat. So we skip shooting and go directly to the combat phase. As you can see in this photo, the Hateful Eight managed to put both of those Ludas directly out of action, managed to wound both of them pretty bad as well. So because of that, those two hit instruments go directly out of action. They will need to roll up to see whether they die or not uh, during the post game as well. So that being said, we go directly to the uh, top of the uh, turn number four for the Orcs and Goblins. And unfortunately for my buddy brother Grim, uh, he has to take a break test at this point because a quarter of his unit is down. So because that, he does have to take a route test, and unfortunately Papa Shango does feel his fair, uh, feel his uh, his uh, route test. He rolls a nine when he I think he needs an eight is when he needs an order to stay. So because of that, the people eaters do flee off the battlefield, which means that the pit fighters are the lone warband left on the battlefield. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That takes us directly to the end of the game with the Pit Fighters and a victory for Sister Serial. So with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, this battle report is now officially over as we go directly to the post-game and talk about exactly what happened to each of the gangs. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over.
All right, so first of all, we go off with the Untamed Beasts of the Norse Marauders. Basically, five members of the uh, Warband were injured. That was Oogla the Maw, Shaint, Clefjaw, as well as Makat. Oogla the Maw actually gets a blinded injury, so because he has minus one to his Ballista skill, which really doesn't matter because Oogla the Maw doesn't have a Ballista skill, but if he gets one more, he is retired, so that's pretty bad. Shaint suffers a Lang Wound, so because that his leap movement characteristic drops to three instead of four, so that part's kind of rough. Clef Skull also gets a Madness injury, and his Madness results in being a Frenzy uh, special rule attached to him, so now because of that, he is also subject to Richard Frenzy. My cat, though, the hunter, he makes a full recovery, so he is perfectly fine as well. For advancements, four members of the Warband Advance, Veral Heart Eater, the Jarl leveled up to a plus one weapon skill, so that part's pretty good. Tenyet First Fang also learned a skill from the Norse uh, skill tree, which is a Berserk Charge, which basically means he gets to reroll missed attacks whenever he charges into close combat. Cliff Skull also leveled up as well, earning plus one to his Ballistic skill, and the Hunters also leveled up as one, uh, well, uh, leveled up as well, earning plus one to their Ballistic skill also. During the exploration phase, they managed to find three shards of weird stone, uh, two of them for normal explanation, and at the same time they rolled doubles, and they found a well, which also did them an additional piece of weird stone. All three weird stone pieces were sold for a grand total of 65 gold pieces. With those 65 gold pieces, they purchased throwing axes for Veral Heart Eater, Mayim Beast Speaker, Tenyet First Fang, as well as Clef Skull, and they took the five remaining gold pieces and put it directly into their treasury. The new record now is at one win and one loss, and a new Warband rating is at 114 points. So with that, we go to House Von Koss, the second warband to flee off this battlefield. For injuries, three members of the House Von Koss were injured. We have Fade Von Koss, the vampire. He manages to get a surviving injury, getting plus one additional experience point. Same thing with Gonfield, the carrying crew, as well as a 66, also getting a survives as well. It gets a plus one to his experience point as well. The five zombies of San, uh, the five zombies from the dead of Sam Remay, four of them made full recoveries, while one of them did die. So because of that, they are now one zombie short. Further advancements, quite a bit of advancement took place for this warband. Fade Von Koss earned plus one to his Ballista skill. Gonfield the Carrion Crows learned another spell, learned the Call of Van Hell spell. Oh, sorry, not the Call of Van Hell spell, the uh, spell called uh, the Spell of Awakening. So that way he can also resurrect dead enemy uh, heroes and bring them to his warband. Narcisse the Ravenous earned plus one to his toughness. Creepy Timothy earned mighty blows so because it gets plus one strength in close combat. And Sinister Jeffrey earns the Strongman skill, which means that whenever he swings a uh, two-handed weapon, he never strikes last, he just strikes his normal initiative, which is all kinds of good. However, probably the most dramatic change of all was for the Bellfire Carnival. All three members of the Bellfire Carnival, Bloodwind, Scumrick, as well as Killham, rolled Lads Got Talent, which means that all three of those guys got promoted up to heroes. And all three skill uh, ghouls have access to the combat as well as speed skills as well. All three of those guys, of course, decided to use the combat skills for their advancement because they both also rolled up on uh, skills for theirs. And they decided to use weapons training skill for all three. So that way they can also use weapons now in close combat. So that part is pretty crazy as well. During the exploration phase, they found four shards of weird stone worth 60 points, and they also discovered a smithy where they discovered three halberds, which they brought back into their warband. For the trading post, they purchased bows for Narcisse the Ravenous, Creepy Timothy, as well as Sinistry Jeffrey, and they gave those short bows to Bloodwind, Scumric, as well as Killam. At the same time, they also purchased shields for Bloodwind, Scumric, as well as Killam, and gave the three newly found halberds to those three ghouls as well. The new record now is at zero wins, as well as two losses, and the new warband rating now is at 117 points. So with that, we go to the People Eaters, the third war band to fly off the table. First of all, they suffered two injuries. Zappa the Snappa made a full recovery, so he is perfectly fine. And the Baron of the Shroomhead also got a nervous condition serious injury put on him, so because he loses one point in his initiative value as well. And that was from both being out of action. He also made a full recovery for his uh, injuries. That, uh, he Sorry, he made a full recovery from the injuries he received in close combat, but because he used the Madcap Mushrooms, he has to roll off on the serious injury table and got the nervous condition from that one, uh, as what the result for that one was. For the advancements, three members of the uh, team advance. Papa Shango learned the cunning plan so that way he can re-roll failed uh, route tests. And Baron Zemini learned the fire of Gork spill as well, allowing him to fire two fireballs with D3 strength 3 hits, which is actually pretty devastating. Meanwhile, the war band that the Snicky gets, the two members of that little uh, henchman posse, they earn plus one to their weapon skills, so now they're a little bit deadlier in close combat. During the exploration phase, they managed to found four shards of weird stone worth 60 gold pieces, and they also rolled a triple result of getting the return a favor discovery, which means that they automatically recruit an ogre bodyguard. For hire, uh, they automatically hired that guy as a hired sword for their team. It doesn't cost them any money at all. His name is Burp So Blood. He's equipped with a great weapon as well as light armor, and they got that guy for free. Uh, however, after the next battle report, though, they will need to pay his upkeep costs, otherwise, he will just walk off. But it's kind of neat because they don't have to pay the 80 gold pieces in order to recruit him right off the bat. 
With their 60 gold pieces, they purchased two short bows for their sneaky gets and hired a second war boy for the war boy um, uh, henchman. They equipped that guy with a bow. They also purchased swords and shields for both members of the war boys as well. The people leader's new score is now a record is at one win and one loss, and the new warband rating now is at 189 points. And lastly, we have the Iron Golems. For injuries, none of the members of the Pit Fires were seriously injured, so none of them have to roll up on the injury table for that part. For advancement, Sever Grill, the leader, earned plus one to his leadership, so because of that, the Pit King is now at leadership nine. Gar and Dramnir also learned the Armist Master ability, which means now that for her Chain Whip, she could actually use a shield now if she wants to in close combat. And Dredge Borsha actually got the Lad's Got Talent ability on him as well. So now he's promoted to the rank of hero, and he got a plus one to his attacks as well, so now he has three attacks. So Dredge Borsha is now it's extremely deadly for this team. Uh, he's really deadly for as a fighter. For their exploration, they found four shards of Weirstone. Three of them were from exploring, and one was from a well. And because of that, they discovered a well during their exploration. And so with that, all four Weirstone shards were sold for 70 gold pieces. With those 70 gold pieces, they purchased a helmet for Sever Grill. They also hired two new pit fight initiates. Those two characters' names are uh, Varkolda Brell, I believe is her name is, as well as Insola Anvil Wild is her name. And both of those uh, initiates are armed with swords as well as shields. The new record now is at two wins as well as zero losses, and the new war band rating now is at 127 points. So that's good to do for this week, guys. As always, please feel free to like, comment, and or subscribe. Your guys' input is invaluable to us as always. Also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the latest, greatest hobby news related to this channel. That's good to do for this week, guys. We'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out and stay classy.